Welcome everyone to the third installment of our Health Equity Book Series. Uh, thank you all for attending. My name is Elizabeth Hart. I am the Director of the Office of Faith-Based and Community Engagement at the Tennessee Department of Health. The Health Equity Book Series is being brought to you by the Division of Health Disparities Elimination, the Office of Primary Prevention, and the Health Equity Advisory Team, all part of the Tennessee Department of Health. We encourage you to drop your questions that you may have for our panelists today in the chat feature. We will be sure to get to those towards the end of today's discussion and presentation. And we are in for a really, really great treat today. We are very excited to have three incredible panelists to talk with us today again about health equity. So at this time, I'm going to read their bios, and then they're going to provide a, a presentation, and then we're going to have a great discussion about some with some questions that were submitted by our Health Disparity Task Force. Speaking of the Health Disparity Task Force, presumably you received this invitation from me if you are a member of the task force. If you are not already a member of the Tennessee Health Disparity Task Force, you are encouraged to join our group and talk about health equity and health disparities across Tennessee. Simply go to healthdisparitiestn.com, healthdisparitiestn.com, and find the information about the task force. Without any further ado, I will introduce our panelists. Yami Nagose is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program Manager at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. In this role, Yami is responsible for implementing the organization's DEI strategy and action plan related to its programmatic portfolio. Previously, she was a program officer directing a consensus study on racial inequality in the criminal justice system in the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education. Since joining the National Academies in 2016, Yami has staffed four major consensus studies, including reports from community-based interventions to promote health equity, reducing alcohol-impaired driving injuries and fatalities, and advancing equity in prenatal and early childhood development. Prior to joining the National Academies, Yami conducted research at Boston University School of Public Health, exploring topics such as intimate partner violence and gun ownership in relation to homicide rates in the United States. Yami was also a co-evaluator of the CDC-funded prevention program in the greater Boston area, which trained residents living in public housing to be health advocates in their communities. In 2014, she worked for the Boston Public Health Commission, assisting in the implementation of a teen dating violence prevention program. She received her MPH from Boston University with concentrations in epidemiology and social and behavioral health and her bachelor's in criminology and criminal justice from the University of Maryland at College Park. Welcome, Yami. Dr. James Weinstein, he joined Microsoft in July 2018 as Senior Vice President of Microsoft Healthcare, leading strategy, inequities, and innovation. During the pandemic, he has worked with Operation Warp Speed and various organizations around the world, including the World Health Organization, CDC, as well as state and local government efforts to bring the Microsoft vaccine platform for enrolling, disseminating, and tracking vaccine participants. For Microsoft, he leads several precision population health efforts to forge new paths to end racial and ethnic disparities. He has been awarded more than $70 million in federal funding and has published more than 330 peer-reviewed articles. He is a leader in advancing informed choice to ensure patients receive evidence-based, safe, effective, efficient, and appropriate care. Dr. Weinstein has been recognized for his research and global contributions with numerous awards and honors. In 2015, he was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor by the National Ethnic Coalition of Organizations. He was the 2017 recipient of the American Hospital Association's Justin Ford Kimball Innovators Award. He has also been named one of the most of one of the 100 most influential people in healthcare by Modern Healthcare Magazine 
and top 50 physicians leaders to know by Becker's Hospital Review. Welcome, Dr. Weinstein. And finally, Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Baca. She is a clinician strategist at Deloitte, providing systems thinking and insights to healthcare and life science clients to support care, delivery, innovation to foster total health and well being, recognizing health equity and sustainability are central to this work. She helps strategically address ESG issues in a comprehensive way. She served in both administrations of Governor Brown and Governor Newsom, first as Senior Health Advisor and then Deputy Director in the Governor's Office of Planning and Research for California. She has worked on a variety of projects to foster health through land use planning, systems change, food systems, precision health, precision medicine, and big data. Much of her work is about connecting the dots. She loves working across sectors to foster participant-centered design and collaboration. A significant part of her work is aligning win-wins for projects that offer co-benefits, particularly in addressing the social, economic, and environmental factors that impact health. As an example, she has done work to improve health through climate mitigation and adaptation projects. In her role with California, she has provided leadership and guidance to several initiatives, including the California Initiative to Advance Precision Medicine, the Global Climate Action Summit, and the California Health Care Climate Alliance. Whew, that was a mouthful. Welcome, welcome to all three of our panelists. If you could take a, a moment or so um, to tell our, our, our viewers a little bit about yourself and their work in health equity, and we'll start with um, uh, Yami. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to the task force for having us today. Um, uh, as Elizabeth Hart mentioned, um, my background is in public health and social epidemiology, um, and my research has been done at the intersection of public health and the criminal justice system and contact with the system. Um, and so in my time at the academies, I've had the pleasure of staffing um, consensus studies on various public health and public safety topics, all of which had an equity focus to them. Um, and one of those, my first project at the academies actually, um, was with the committee that authored the report Communities in Action Pathways to Health Equity. Wonderful, uh, Dr. Baca? Yes, and it, it echo to echo Yami, thank you so much for having us. It's really an honor to be here. Um, well, I, you know, I think throughout my career, I mean, even when I started doing work um, before medical school, I did my first master's in Venezuela, actually, um, and was working on the social determinants before they were called social determinants. So just this really, you know, very like passion about health, but recognizing why there were certain populations that were more impacted than others. Um, I actually, when I did residency, did a special residency program called, at the time, Pediatric Leadership for the Underserved. So it was really starting to understand both the clinical knowledge that you needed to take care of patients, but also the broader social, economic, and environmental conditions. And it's just been, you know, a passion. I think one of the things, good and bad, that we, we were talking about just in terms of preparing for the panel is, um, the report was a couple of years ago. There's still a number of things that are present. So these are long-standing historic issues that we're confronting. But I, you know, I'm passionate about really seeing an inflection point for change. So excited to be joining for this conversation today. Wonderful. And Dr. Weinstein. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and um, thank the the um, state of Tennessee for all the state is doing and. Uh, there's so much good happening in Tennessee. We're excited to see where, where it ends. Um, my career really started in inner city Chicago. Uh, grew up there, raised there, worked there till I was a third year medical student in a factory. Um, went to medical school in inner city Chicago. Um, I never thought about race issues, to be honest with you. So it's kind of interesting to me because I always lived amongst many races. Um, uh, during the Kosovo uh, bombings, I spent a lot of time in Kosovo uh, as an orthopedic surgeon taking care of the injured from uh, that kind of destruction that today we're seeing in, in Ukraine. Um, 
I lost our oldest daughter to leukemia when she was 12, um, which uh, changed my life after 12 years of chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, at Dartmouth, I was privileged to run the Dartmouth Institute and um, uh, the Dartmouth Atlas Project, which has uh, looked at uh, utilization of healthcare for decades in the United States and the inequities of those uh, that utilization, which uh, as I look back at that work over decades of time, uh, unfortunately hasn't changed much. And so um, I was privileged to work with uh, Dr. Baca and Yami on this first report by the National Academy that we'll share some with you. Um, and I just want to say that that group that um, worked together was quite diverse, uh, really represented the country well. Yami can speak more to that. And we didn't trust each other at the start, probably, and this is seven years ago. Uh, but we grew to love each other. And, and to respect each other. And for me, one of the nice parts about this, Elizabeth, is to be with Dr. Baca and Yami today, who um, carry on this great work. So thank you for allowing us to be together again. It is certainly our pleasure, and thank you all for, um, for agreeing to speak with us today. And as you mentioned, the report that you all worked on, Communities in Action, Pathways to Health Equity, is a phenomenal, phenomenal report. Um, if you want to, Yami, then take over control and, and um, provide a couple of slides to our task force before we get into our discussion. Absolutely. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Yeah. It's, it's there. Just Great. need to go to slide presentation mode. Yeah. There's sort of a lag on my end. There we go. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I wanted to provide some sort of stage setting uh, comments about this report and the process behind the consensus study um, that led to this report. Um, and, you know, as we mentioned, the report was released in 2017. So, some of the data and statistics in the report itself may be dated, um, but the committee's key findings, the conclusions, and the recommendations remain really salient for our discussions today around health equity. Um, the report was authored by a diverse and multidisciplinary committee, as Jim mentioned, uh, that's sort of a hallmark of our consensus study committees at the National Academies. Uh, we have representation from the public and private sector um, from academia, community development, and we had areas of expertise uh, across a wide range of disciplines, including health and medicine, sociology, education, um, civil rights law, psychology, bioethics, and more. And so here you see the membership of our committee. Um, this was a fairly large committee and, and the diverse makeup made the deliberations challenging, but I think ultimately led to a report with high impact and far reach. The committee's task was to review the state of health disparities in the United States, to identify root causes of health inequities in the US, to identify examples of communities addressing health inequities, um, to identify the major elements of promising solutions as well as their key levers, policies, and stakeholders, and then to recommend elements of short and long-term strategies and solutions for communities to consider as well as research needs. Um, Jim and Elizabeth will sort of walk you through some of the key findings and conclusions of the report, um, but ultimately the bottom line messages are that health equity is crucial for the well-being and vibrancy of communities, that health is a product of multiple determinants, um, that health inequities are in large part a result of poverty, structural racism, and discrimination, that communities have agency to promote health equity, um, but that supportive public and private policies at all levels and programs facilitate community action. And finally, that the collaboration and engagement of new and diverse multi-sector partners is essential to advancing health equity. Uh, I'll pass things over to Jim. I was trying to come off mute. Um, thanks, Yami. <laughs> um, I think the one of the challenges for all of us sometimes is how to tell the story and um, in as simple as way as possible. So I think the committee thought about 
what picture could we draw uh, on a tabula rasa that maybe incorporated what was known at the time through the RWJ Foundation and, and other organizations like the Prevention Institute that had looked at some of the social determinant issues? And what would we add to that in a, in a dynamic way that um, actually uh, was a living model, not just a model for today. But I think this this image, uh, not sure you can read it, but we started out with context. You know, what's the context in which these inequities exist? Because if we don't understand the context, we might not understand the, the biases, the social, economic, and or political drivers that we're all aware today that are causing this. We were a little uh, prescient in this report, I think. And as Yami said, um, it, it's really holding up well. Um, that's good and bad. It's good that it was uh, holding up well. It's bad that it's holding up well because we still haven't solved the problems. Um, I think we think of this, if you can see the bottom of this picture, it doesn't really show up in the slide, but it really says that these social economic issues are non-linear. They're, they're not always cause and effect. The causal inferences from A doesn't always mean B. And it's really hard to even model those causal inferences uh, in any quantitative way because every community is different. And so this 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 committee focused on that uh, unit of communities. And if you have a chance to look at the report, there are quite a few examples of really outstanding work by some of the communities that we studied. We studied over a hundred communities um, and, and uh, outlined in, in the report some of the most interesting, like being able to walk safe to school, things, you know some of us didn't have to think about. Um, having a sustainable model for food. Um, you know, we think of food deserts today, but are they sustainable? The nutrition issues in, in underserved communities. And then we, we, of course, thought about the social determinants and we actually added transportation, which wasn't one of the original RWJ social issues because in Chicago, for example, one of the cities we looked at, you know, a lot of the inner city communities were kind of moved out to regentrify the city, uh, which helped the economics of the city on rents and property taxes, but moved a lot of the, the, the unfortunate families into diaspora. And so then transportation becomes a huge problem in many of these issues and still an issue today. Um, and I think we walked away with kind of three uh, three uh, components that are important in thinking about solutions uh, outlined uh, in the middle there. Um, making health equity a shared vision and value in a community. It's the communities that we're talking about that have to share those values. This can't just be a government approach. Um, we have plenty of government approaches. Some people would say we have almost a single payer system in the country today with Medicare and Medicaid. But it's the communities that are actually going to change the health of the people that they're neighbors with. Increasing the community's uh, capacity to shape, shape outcomes. You can't do this by yourself. We couldn't do this report by ourselves. It's the, the diversity of opinions that's the, the strength in finding the solutions. It's when we disagree that we actually find ways to agree. Um, and so the conflicts today that we find in you know, the politics of, of the day, I think are not what the solution set is. Um, as I studied Martin Luther King and why he was a good leader, um, it wasn't just because he was a good orator and he could attract, you know, millions of people to his messages. It's because he was strategic, I believe, in thinking about how nonviolent protest could get the attention of politicians. And in his case, he developed a great friendship with President Johnson, which led to the Civil Rights Act. 
And today we need that kind of come together through our communities. Um, to think about how great leaders like Dr. King and others, many others, maybe many of you listening today, can mobilize things to change the policies that the communities can then become responsible for in a sustainable model. And I'll just end by saying that um, we also realize that there needs to be a financial model for sustainability. And, and I think the notion today of, you know, philanthropic work or, or uh, like in Kosovo, a lot of the NGOs would come and go. There was no sustainable model for the people. So as we think through these things, we have to empower the communities with resources that they own and control and have the KPIs or the outcome measures that they become responsible for. And to that end, I think community-based organizations like the churches and the church networks are really important as they became apparent in COVID. We need now to support them for everyday advancement. So thank you again, Elizabeth, for the opportunity. I'll turn it over to Dr. B, uh, our Elizabeth uh, from the committee, Elizabeth. That's great. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I mean, in, in the that framework, again, I even now in my work and I have transitioned roles from um, being on the government side, but to being in the private sector side. And um, not only do I talk about this framework all the time about the importance of being community driven and really putting community voice first, working on a couple of things right now. But I think it's just such a great anchor across how all of these pieces are interconnected. It's it's complicated because it is so systemic. But um, if we go to the next slide, I mean, I think, um, you know, and I mentioned when I was in clinical care, that was a big part of my own aha of, you know, especially being in pediatrics. When I went into pediatrics, I was really interested in a lot of different fields, um, particularly neurosurgery. Ended up going into pediatrics. I was so passionate about prevention. And so I thought, oh, well, if I, if I do this in pediatrics, then I'll be able to prevent this and it'll, it'll, it'll all be okay. And as I started practicing, it was really, really honestly quite shocking to me to see these differences, right? So across the board, we would see differences in outcomes. This is just one around infant mortality. Um, so um, this has been, you know, if you look um, black or African-American, the infant mortality is 10.6 per thousand births. I mean, just staggering numbers, um, you know, when you look across the different um, race and ethnicity um, groups, uh, why we see such a big difference. Um, and the thing is, is even though, you know, I think one of the things about the report that has been so powerful is it was, as, as Yami mentioned, it was rooted in looking at what what the status was. And there are a lot, a lot of, there's been a lot of great work and it's so important to know kind of where you're starting from. But I think one of the other pieces is that it was solutions oriented. Um, so I think we'll, we'll get to that more in the discussion. That said, I think it's still really an important starting point for any of the work to be grounded in kind of what the starting basis is as you're starting to think about KPIs. And we saw that with a number of the community organizations we were looking at. That was a newer thing because it was often like, you know, everyone's trying to do really good work. And so that was part of as we were looking across all of the nonprofits that we we look to looking for organizations that were able to start to think about metrics, um, both from a, what kind of health outcomes were they were impacting, but also how that connected um, directly to impact. If we go to the next slide, um, this is, I, I think, you know, again, um, we, we put this in there. This is now there are some more um, live dashboards that exist across the country that you can look to um, for, for your for your own areas. But um, this also came from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. But just recognizing, you know, I think and, and literally I was just um, I ran into somebody yesterday um, while I was exercising and we started having this conversation about like what we do for work. Um, and, and he, you know, he's not in, in medicine, he's in accounting and he was like asking. And, and so I started explaining and he, I mean, most people again are just shocked to see these kinds of different outcomes. Right? So the question to me yesterday was like, isn't it genes? Like, that's a pretty small percent. You know, there are some conditions where that's the case, but 
these are the kinds of numbers you look at and you can see this this discrepancy this this change you know this disparity over 10 years difference in life expectancy in a couple mile radius and that's where you know going back to the framework we really started to narrow in how do we think about how all of these different drivers of health are starting to impact outcomes um and i think that um is particularly powerful as we start to overlay some of the opportunities around place-based um, initiatives, which we saw a lot of the, the groups doing. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is just to say we, you know, um, one of the things just in terms of the Tennessee context, it's always so helpful. Um, this is at, at a broad level. This is still not necessarily um, broken out by, by race and ethnicity, but I think um, there's, you know, to, to, to Jim's earlier point, one of the things is there's not a one size fits all approach for this. And I think that was also one of the big things um, that we talked about a lot within the committee and even as, how do you let lift up the lessons learned from a lot of the great communities doing work when there's not, you know, it's, it's not the same there were. So we wanted to pull out key elements, but um, this was just to give a snapshot and some of the life expectancy numbers um, specifically within Tennessee. And you can see there are um, differences and we would expect even more differences as you start to, to separate it out um, by category. Um, so I think, you know, I think that, and, and I'm really excited for the discussion to get into some of the, um, the, the, what we, you know, um, unpacked during, during the committee process in terms of specific solutions. But I think that was really kind of a foundational starting point of making sure it was grounded and looking at numbers, really thinking about what communities were doing and how could we lift that out, um, and, and really learn from those really exciting examples geared towards thinking about solutions. So I think on that, um, the last piece is just, um, we really, you know, this is our overarching conclusion um, is that this is, it's it's the country's overall health, economic vitality and national security. And again, it's, we, we were just even talking like, unfortunately, we're, we're still thinking about the costs. Um, and um, I think one of the, the big takeaways is there, there are costs. There's a huge um, price you know, associated with the racial disparities. Um, and we could save a lot of money, wrap that back in towards prevention and well-being. Um, we know that there are, are impacts to um, even just in terms of being able to serve in the military. Um, but I think if you, you read the preface, one of the things that we also started with is just the moral um, compass of being able to address these issues um, to make sure we get this right. So on that, I would love to, to open it up for, for questions from um, Elizabeth, from you and, and the audience as well. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation and and kind of in that vein, I just lost my um, <laughs> lost my lights there for a second. Um, in that same vein, as we were having uh, the the presentation that you provide, you know, what have you did you all find some of what are the biggest drivers of the health inequalities um, in your study? Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Sure, I can start. And, uh, my colleagues, I mean. There are structural issues in the country, um, which we call out in the report. And, you know, these go back a long time. This isn't new, right? So, you know, whether it's the highway system or the housing systems, we moved people uh, as a corporate society to different communities and just thought that was a solution set. We didn't think about the, the impact of those moves very effectively. And that was really both our government and corporate America. It, you know, everybody has some fault here. I, I, I think that, you know, again, I grew up in Chicago, but the housing projects were an interesting idea. Let's put everybody in these six buildings, right? That, that, that's not a strategy. That, that's like, I can build something to put people into without thinking about a strategy that allows people to raise up and build their own life. And unfortunately, that strategy, the highway system strategy being built around those uh, neighborhoods um, still exists today. And and I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to be very blunt, Elizabeth, but you know, everybody talks about these things, but not in their backyard. And and I think that's really sad um, because as 
we as a committee spoke, we were blatantly honest about the issues and the solutions. And, you know, I, I think you can have a big hammer or you can have an empowerment of the community to change these structural issues and these racial issues and these inherent bias issues. But if you're not willing to have those honest conversations, and I and I do blame politics a lot, uh, so forgive me. Um, and and it is finding unique leaders like King that can mobilize a population, white and black, not not just black, to realize the inequities that we have to take on and, and, and too often it's the quick fix. These cannot be fixed quickly. I, I know hopefully in your audience is Reverend Baker and I've gotten to know Bobby from Memphis quite well. I, I consider him a friend. And what Bobby did in the Memphis model was fortunately recognized by President Obama, but he mobilized the church network as a trusted network, but the health systems for the health people in the audience, I'm not sure they gave Bobby what he needed to sustain the impact. And Bobby can yell at me afterwards, but we need models where those networks become primary care facilities, not from the medical distribution of healthcare per se, but most of the problems aren't related to healthcare just getting a meal or a, a, a ride or a place to talk to somebody. So, so what we found is everything you see. And, and I'll stop there. So Elizabeth or Yami. Yeah, I was going to add to that. I mean, I think every, everything you said, the other pieces, um, and this goes back to why I think the data can be so powerful. So one of the interesting and the structural pieces is, is is really important. Um, when you map out the life expectancy data and you see the geospatial um, difference we were showing, you can do the same thing around redlining. So a lot of the communities from a structural perspective and where community investments were made a really long time ago in terms of where communities could live. And so what you see is this um, effect where it impacts the tree canopy, it impacts walkability, it impacts availability to local food sources. So it ends up being that you can map those those things and, and you see that um, pretty clearly for the most part, it's, it's fairly consistent across the US. Um, so the structural piece is, is a big driver, but I think to Jim's point, one of the big things is that um, because of that, it, when we looked at the community examples, you know, you know, you could be really well intentioned coming in with what you think is a great solution and it doesn't move because it's not what the community needs. It's not what's going to resonate and work and this whole piece around um, how things can be so different based on different, you know, history and dynamics trust as we talked about is another really big one. And so that was one of the key um, pieces and what became part of the center point um, for all of this work driving forward is really authentically making sure community is a key partner and really moving beyond um, it's creating a level of, of power essentially um, to an agency to make that change. Um, and Yami, I see you shaking your head, so I'd love to, to hear your thoughts as well. I completely agree, Elizabeth. I think, um, you know, in the committee's process, they, we called through examples of nonprofits, community based organizations, all covering a range of those social, economic, environmental sort of factors. And, and in some of our earlier conversations, you know, some folks might say, I'm, I'm not working on health equity issues. You know, we, we provide, um, you know, um, sort of financial literacy courses and and opportunities for folks to save and invest. And we, you know, and being able to translate that work into a health health, health equity lens, excuse me, um, was really powerful, I think, um, and one of a major contributions of the report as we think about it in this holistic way. I mean, could you could you also comment a little bit how the National Academy uh, works and how this committee and the report also was an impetus to what you do now. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Jim. You know, the, the National Academies were a nonprofit organization that provides sort of objective advice to the nation on matters of sciences, engineering, and medicine. And so this report um, and this project was sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, in an effort to inform its culture of health initiative, which is broad and far reaching and really impactful. Um, and, and so we convened this committee, this multidisciplinary group to review the evidence deliberate, um, and then to define key findings, conclusions, and recommendations for policy and practice. Um, and so that's sort of a, a really um, sort of prime example of our work at the academies. Um, and once this report was published, we heard from our stakeholders, our target audiences, um, a resounding yes, thank you. You know, it means something for the National Academies to say, the root causes of health inequities are poverty, discrimination, and structural inequities. Um, and, and then moving forward in our work, you know, as I mentioned, I'm also I worked in the criminal justice space, and and being able to point to an academy's report that says the evidence points to these root causes, not just with respect to health inequity, but also tying to criminal justice outcomes, to opportunities for employment, um, you know, to educational attainment. Um, has been really powerful in our work. And so we certainly still use the report as a resource and it's, it's the number 9, uh, downloaded report in the health and medicine division of the national academies to date. Um, and so it's been a resource for many folks, um, across sectors and audiences. Yeah, number 9 out of 2000. So plus, so it, it's not number 9 out of 10, but, um. <laughs> That's Kentucky, but um, <laughs> that is that's wonderful, and thank you so much for for providing that context, not only um to the inequalities, but also the the context to the national academies. I'm sorry, you wanted to say something else, Dr. Weinstein? Go ahead. No, just saying, Yami, yeah, mean, you might talk about your new role and how that evolved from from this kind of work as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm um, in my new role. You know, we've established an office of diversity and inclusion last year at the National Academies. Um, and in part of our organizational DEI strategy, um, you know, one of the main focuses is being able to apply a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens to our projects. Um, and so communities in action, again, is just like a paragon for this effort. It's it's really a great example of how a diverse committee could lead to a really impactful report and how taking an equity lens to our work, whether those are workshops, reports, and so on and so forth, um, can really make an impact in societal outcomes. Um, and so that's what we're doing across the board with our program divisions and our work, hoping to advance DEI in STEM um, and then also in outcomes across the sort of portfolio of work that we engage in. Across all the national academies. And, and I think that's it's right. interesting historically, Elizabeth, that you know Abraham Lincoln, started the National Academies. And um, it was meant to be an advisory body for Congress, uh, and still is. But that history, just like the history of Dr. King, we shouldn't forget the history. You know, um, the people here today, we, we didn't start this. We didn't come up with something new. We, we stand on the shoulders of many people who came before us. But we have to solve this today, right? And, and so I call on all of us who are listening to come together to solve some of the greatest problems because there's plenty of money out there. It's not a resource issue. It's how it's spent or misspent. And, and then the empowerment of the people in the communities, which this report's all about, and the examples of if they're empowered, what they actually accomplish is remarkable. So, so, so I hope that, you know, just by your invitation will help stimulate this dynamic conceptual model to a real working situation that's sustainable in Tennessee. And that's exactly one of the reasons why we wanted to invite you to to, to speak to our to speak to our group today. So um, I want to encourage folks if you have questions for the panelists to drop that in the chat. I do have a question from one of our our attendees um, who works um, to implement statewide programs. Um, they said, from a pr programmatic perspective, in trying to go beyond the critical work of intentionally reaching out to underserved populations, what additional advice do you have to center? 
our programs on health equity? Ooh, that is a, a, a terrific question. It was one of the things that we definitely, um, and I'll put on my former state hat role and some of the conversations we had with the committee. I mean, there are, are numerous and there are lots of great examples um, of ways to do that. I think one of the um, the big places to do that, and maybe, Yami, if we can, if we have that slide handy, we can walk through some of that. I think one is just in terms of land use planning. Um, and there, there's there's a lot, it can be in terms of how you even structure your RFPs. That was something we actually in California did a lot. Like there needs to be a certain, you know, you, you need to look at the data, um, how you think about partnering with community groups. So there's a lot there, but when we, when we look to the official recommendations, um, that within the committee that we talked about, I think 1 in particular from a state um, side is to really think about intentionally. Given the nature of how powerful as we were talking about transportation, food systems, housing, all of those things are um, is to start to think about just even the, the piece of how you do community engagement. Um, it depends on the state um, and, you know, and the local jurisdiction right on what is required in terms of land use approvals and processes. But just even that element of having a, a forum where, you know, even how you design it, what time of the day is it? Is there childcare? Is there food? Just being able to have community come in and participate. Um, the other piece is, and this has not been as much, there's definitely been a, a big push here um, in terms of um, how partnership happens, right? So even bringing in public health departments. So often these decisions are made outside of public health, but being able to have a collaborative work group um, or even a working group to start to think about unintended consequences um, and impacts on health and well-being. Um, just as one example, um, there can be really um, powerful um, connection points around uh, electric vehicle st charging stations and where they get placed. So you could have, we're really trying to do this great policy, but you're not thinking about where they get placed. And so disproportionately, you have better air impacts in different communities, right? Um, and, and the slide disappeared, but I know that the other ones, um, <laughs> no, no worries. Um, some of the other ones were just um, like multi-sector collaboration. So how you bring in some of those other partners um, and then um, and thinking about co-benefits. So this is one where really thinking about align, aligning wins. Um, so it's not maybe just, and this was, you know, as Yami was mentioning, sometimes someone's talking about health literacy and they're like, well, that's not health equity. And it's like, it is, and it's really framing that up to try to get to um, more of the benefits from doing these projects. Um, and then the last is, um, and this was a specific one around affordable housing, because we thought that was so important um, for any statewide programs that are being implemented at a policy level um, to, to really think about, and this is a, a, a big challenge, and, and I've had this conversation um, a lot with communities. It's like, we're doing community improvement, and then it improves the community, it increases prices, and people end up getting pushed out and it has this unintended consequence. And so really embedding strategies. And again, there are a lot of a lot of um, policies and places where that, that have started to, to do that, whether it be buying off land early on or um, thinking about mitigation measures or putting protections in place for um, for for folks that are already located in that area. So those I mean, there are many more, but these were really the key ones as we thought. Um, from some of the land use planning perspective at a state level that can happen. One of the things to pick up on uh, Elizabeth's comments, there's a book by a guy named Ron, Ron Adner um, called Wide Lens, Wide Lens. And it talks about how major companies and cities fail because they haven't thought about like the charging stations. Um, and, and they have a and we see this in healthcare all the time uh, in the venture space. Fantastic idea. I can tell you where the brain tumor is. I can make sure um, you get the right treatment, but I can't integrate it to the health system. So, so it fails, right? So what we need to do is have that wide lens approach and understand the issues. And I think a lot of inequities are because we aren't looking at the wide lens with a wide lens view. We think about solving some people's problems, but not all people's problems. And as I said before, every community is different. And, and so, you know, uh, I, I really think that solution sets are not dictated by us. We, we gave suggestions, but I think we mentioned pieces 
and the inefficiencies of not taking that wide lens approach. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful. It is wonderful. Thank you for providing that context. So we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, um, but we, so we know that where you live and work matter um, to your health. Um, what steps should we take to ensure everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status, has that equal opportunity to live a long, healthy life and level that imbalance of life expectancy disparities? I know, uh, Dr. Baca, you, you somewhat mentioned that previously um, when we were going through the slides, if you would like to talk a little bit about that. I think it's, this is where it's 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 a tough answer because it's kind of addressing all of these things. Um, I think you know one of the big pieces, and this is I, this is where I think is and Jim was starting to touch on that. Like, it's not just one entity. It can't just be a Department of Public Health. You could do the most amazing campaigns and and education do all, and it's still not going to get there. Um, nonprofits can do amazing, just brat, you know, really hard work, and it's not going to get there. And I think that. Part of what we were saying in a lot of the recommendations are that it does take this kind of whole of community approach to get there. Um, so I think it's really thinking about how the businesses think and plan, how all of these sectors come together, um, and that everybody has a role. I think one of the other things is even as we look at this, it can be a bit daunting because there is so much to be done. Um, and so I think you know part of it is. Um, Kind of picking charting that path from a strategic standpoint of what the 1st and most important thing is to tackle and then really going in um, there, but it's a, it's a big question. I I'd love to, to hear thoughts from from my co panelists. 1, 1 of the things Elizabeth and, and um, Elizabeth's from Tennessee understands this too. Um, you know, we, during the Obama administration. The uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was started, and I had some small role in that. Um, and you know, ten billion dollars were allocated. And if you look at the reports on the success of that, it's not very good. Um, and and so sometimes we're picking the wrong winners, right? And I think, and I'm going to this will offend some colleagues, I'm sure, in the audience. But even places like Dartmouth, where I came from, or now I work at Microsoft, we're not necessarily the place that's going to do the best job. And and we continue. We need to look at the Reverend Bakers of the world, who don't have the academic track record and CV or Vita that a grant application might get attracted to, but boy, they can deliver, right? And that's to Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's point. We need to incorporate everybody. I think that's been a mistake for us as a country. We tend to reward those who've already been rewarded and not look at those who have not even had a chance to be considered. And and so I I, I hope we can open our eyes as the Center for Medicare, Medicaid innovation for all people, just like the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness for all, not for some. And, and so I know I'm pushing some buttons here, but I'm doing it on purpose because I'm tired of seeing the same old, same old, not deliver. Yeah, Jim, that's it. I mean, that's one of the things it's in, we in California um, at the time, because it is, it's you, these, um, Grants for proposals can be so complex and it takes whole teams and even how do you track down the numbers and what data is available? Some of the stuff was just making data platforms more available, but there was actually a whole process to help um, with applications for some of the jurisdictions that had the hardest um, kind of hill to climb, steepest hill to climb to be successful because we it was the same thing. You see the money kind of going tends to go to the same places. So definitely agree on that. Yeah, that, that's a huge opportunity. I, I was privileged to be a reviewer of some of the grants for California. And it was always, you know, people I knew, right, who already had the riches. Not that they weren't going to do fantastic work, but I think, you know, maybe some policy around 50% of those applications have to be from non traditional applicants. And, and we could do policies like that. And we can definitely do better. So why not take the chance? I just wanted um, 
you know, speaking to this question, raise up some of these principles that the authoring committee of the report developed after reviewing the evidence and after reviewing the various community based examples. Um, you know, they developed these guiding principles and they're pretty fairly high level, but I think really touch on many of the themes that were just discussed, um, including nurturing the next generation of leadership. Many of the programs that were examined and, and highlighted in chapter five of the report had some sort of youth development component, whether that was civic engagement or, or workforce development or so on, um, to foster flexibility, creativity, and resilience, um, to adopt strategies for authentic community engagement, of course, to commit to results and systematic learning, um, and to really embrace cross-boundary collaboration, um, and then again, to uh, consider non-traditional partners. And so going back to what Jim said, it might not be the typical sort of um, hospital or anchor institution that you might think of, right? But some of our deeply rooted institutions and communities that really have the capacity to affect change. Those are all wonderful, wonderful suggestions. Thank you for that. And in, in our, our 10 minutes we still remain, we've got a couple more questions for you all. Um, we talked about some success stories. Um, um, I know um, uh, Dr. Weinstein has, has mentioned uh, uh, Bobby Baker, who actually does sit on our Health Disparities Task Force in the Memphis area. But can the group, um, based on the report, uh, the Communities in Action Pathways to Health Equity report, can you provide some examples of communities that are, have been tackling health and equity and what they've been doing within their community so that you know we as a task force can look to, the, to these examples perhaps um, to, to, to launch in our own communities. Yeah. Uh, Yami, do we have some of those slides in the appendix? We, the, you'll have all the slides, Elizabeth, and all the references. And we're, um, we were talking about this in preparation for the meeting, too, because these examples um, are quite good. And where possible, we can try to connect you to these organizations. Um, you know, some are still ongoing and some aren't, haven't been successful. But, you know, there are things you'd think about. So in cities like uh, Minneapolis, very different than the Bayou in Mississippi or Boston. Or so. so we looked at pretty diverse communities. And I, 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 I'm not an expert on the examples, but, you know, you can read these as well as I can. But you know, preventing youth violence, 62% change in uh, gunshot victims. Boy, that still holds up today, right? Well, wow. Well, 76% uh, youth arrest with guns. I mean, these are things that, um, unfortunately, and I go back to why they haven't changed, is because we keep doing the same old things with the same old people. And that's why I'm so passionate about changing that. But the Delta Health Center in Mississippi, um, low birth weight, you know, Elizabeth talked about the uh, perinatal mortality rates, which are in, unacceptable in a country with such tremendous um, uh, health and wellness facilities in our country. And still, we had stories of people who came and, you know, uh, the patient would sit in the waiting room for hours when early attention would have changed the outcome for that mother and baby. Um, so these are preventable. Uh, Boston's done some interesting work on the academic side, which I think is also incredibly fundamental to our future success. Um, Yami was talking about nurturing future, our future leaders. It starts in, you know, grade school, you know, doing the basic understandings of math, science, uh, liberal arts educations, um, and changing those scores so that then these communities can have people come back with the kind of knowledge to build the future, not just leave the future. Um, so there's other examples, and I don't know if Yami or, or, or Elizabeth, Dr. Becca wants to comment. Yeah, I would say um, I think the the we act. I think it might be on a, um, another another slide. Oh, there we are, there we go. Um, is one that I just in in Mandela Marketplace in Oakland. So I'm based in California, and um, you know, I, I it's just I think what's really interesting um, from me from my perspective in the sustainable housing program as well. Um, I think you know thinking about multiple, and this is where the co benefits come in. Um, so so for instance. Um, 
the Mandela marketplace, it's really interesting because we often think about food systems and it's like, you know, food insecurity and then you, you know, provide the food and then, but like what's changed. And so from a systems perspective, they actually really thought about um, entrepreneurship, um, job ownership opportunities um, with the revenue base. And so I think that that really, I think, stood out as is really interesting. Um, and then for, for React, I think one of the things that was really interesting in particular was this um, piece around policy change. So linking the advocacy, but moving beyond just the programmatic perspective and really starting to think about policy change. And um, I was just doing some some work with a nonprofit out there recently and just like the the um the the knowledge of their work is just so fundamental and, and really revered um by other community groups because of that approach but i mean this is just a we looked at so many so there are so many great opportunities to, to i would say in the the report to, to find out more um from the interviews that we did and i think a lot of what we um when we did the report was really learning lessons learned and like what the takeaways were the challenges um, how they got ahead of challenges and and what um, was contributing to their success. So, great resource. Wonderful. Thank. You. Oh, go ahead, Yami. I just I wanted to note on a really positive note as we were preparing for this presentation and I, we were revisiting these community based organizations to be able to link out to their web pages. I was really delighted to see that all of them are still active, um, maybe in a slightly different form, but all sort of still active in their work for health equity. That's wonderful, wonderful to hear. And I, I have sent out that report to our task force. And so in these final minutes that we have remaining, I'm going to have you all think about some parting words for um, our task force. But I want to remind everyone that is listening and watching um, to get this information, not only this report, um, but other resources that the panel has sent to me. And you want to get on our distribution list, um, you can email me at elizabeth.hart at tn.gov. That's elizabeth.hart at tn.gov. More information, including the recording of this particular panel, will be on our website along with so many other resources at www.healthdisparitiestn.com. That is the Division of Health Disparities Elimination website. Again, that's healthdisparitiestn.com. So in the final minutes remaining, I would love for you all to give some parting words of some advice to not only our task force, but anyone else in Tennessee who may be watching this recording and has, has actually looked at your report. Uh, how can we do our best to address health equity? I will start with Yami. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think to respond to this, I'd like to put my DEI hat on um, and, you know, we spoke to the importance of having a diverse committee with different backgrounds, areas of expertise and perspectives, um, engaging non traditional partners. And so I think my parting thoughts would be take a look around the table and see who's there and who's not there, who has um, an equitable sort of voice or um, part in your work. Um, and if you see a voice or a seat, a seat that's empty or a voice that's missing, um, fill it and find a way to engage um, that person or that voice. Dr. Baca. Yeah, I, I love that. I often say it starts with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or <laughs> whatever makes sense. But sometimes I think, you know, partly um, there's a lot to be done and it can be a bit overwhelming and it can seem, you know, like, oh, my gosh, there's there's a lot to be done. Um, but I think we all, everybody is part of the solution. And um, I think we have a lot of people that we don't necessarily, an organiz organizations and institutions. So it's just, I think the more, you know, we talk about this a lot is bridging that gap of understanding, um, understanding where there's some uh, alignment is a great way to move things forward. And I, I think it just starts with building the relationship. Thank you so much. And Dr. Weinstein. Well, first, thank you on behalf of our whole team uh, for having us. We, we represent a small part of uh, this work. Um, I, I'm always reminded of quotes and, um, you know, if you watch TV, sometimes I do, not very frequently, but there's these shows with kind of singers that get picked by various, I don't even know what it's called, but there was a girl named Jane Kristen Marchowski. And Jane, uh, unfortunately, has passed away from breast cancer. But she said two things that I'll always remember. She said, you can't wait until your life isn't hard anymore to be happy. 
And she said, don't you want to see what happens if you don't give up? And so I'm hoping that we don't give up, that we keep supporting each other, as our colleagues said, and keep these conversations going, because I want to see what happens. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all again so much for this incredible panel and for being part of our health equity book series. Um, again, sponsored by the Division of Health Disparities Elimination, the Health Equity Advisory Team, and the Office of Primary Prevention at the Tennessee Department of Health. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.